Welcome everybody to our talk. Um, this is the MFA online talk, Emerging Artists, Sustaining a Practice and Making Connections When the World Goes Online. We're joined by uh, Park E. Moore, who is a writer, curator, and art historian. Also, um, Emma Lucy O'Brien. She's the director of Visual Carlo. So thank you for being here with us. And um, we have a chat function. Um, so just if you have any questions along the way, put them in there and we'll check them periodically for when we have a discussion after. So we're gonna go through all of the contributors using an image as a kind of guide for our conversation. And if it's okay with all of you, uh, Emma and I are gonna sort of open up a little bit to questions. So we're gonna use the sort of image that's on the screen as the um, guide for us to move through each of the contributors. And so maybe, it, and then we can have a conversation afterwards. So maybe we could have the first image, maybe by Barbara. Is that possible? Or we could start with this. Uh, this is, this is um, Isabella. Isabella, are you here today? Um, yes, but I'm Lorraine today. Okay, you're Lorraine today. Yeah. Um, Emma, do you want to begin with some kind of observations or questions about this or will I? Uh, no, I, I don't mind jumping right into this. Uh, hi, Lorraine. Um, so uh, I thought this work was really, really interesting. Um, and one of the first things that kind of came up is uh, you had said in, in your statement was this idea of human nature as uh, our ideas around human nature inhibit us. Um, and, and that's something that I just, I suppose I wanted to maybe unpack a little bit with you, or maybe you had something uh, to tell us about that in terms of your work. Um, well, so I've always felt like it's quite personal, my work, and I've always felt quite limited um, by what, what is expected of humans, I suppose, in a way that, in a humanist way, and when you're talking about humanism, you have to talk about, you know, the origins of it, which is um, religion. So I suppose in that way, and how people are, you know, expected that they should be a certain way and act a certain way, and certain things are not seen as um, acceptable and things like that. So I just feel like all of these kinds of labels and things like that, they, they really limit people. So I guess that's what I meant by that. Uh, the other thing I suppose is uh, just in terms of how we can exist online. Um, so I suppose we're, we're for sure in a moment where we're reprogramming our systems of race, gender, sexuality in real life and also in terms of kind of the virtual world. And um, so uh, I'm, I suppose I'm just thinking about your characters and how they exist, like looking at the images that were, that we were that were presented to us, there are very much things that could be, you know, not necessarily online, but on a gallery wall uh, as photo photographs. So, you know, there, there seems to be these two, two parts of where your work can sit. Um, and I'm wondering, is there a huge difference in how they might sit in a virtual world or an online world and then maybe sit in a gallery context? Yeah, there's definitely a big difference. Um, I made my work this year um, for to be presented online, really. Um, and the, I, I've also printed them for a, an exhibition up in Belfast. And really, like, it is completely different. I think in when it's printed, it has a much more of a presence to see the work as a tangible like thing that you can see an object definitely makes it more real but it's almost like I'm bringing something that is digital into the real world and that's kind of like what the work now is about it's about the digital self and the digital experience um, and bringing it into reality um it also just in terms like it looks like you're having lots of fun with this as well. Like there's good, there's great humor in this. So I'm wondering about your your practice and how you how you approach things. So there's the kind of the making of the images, there's making of costumes, there's the creation of characters. Um, so almost which which part comes first? Is uh, is it the character that kind of leads to to the rest? Yes, the first thing that, um, actually the number one first thing that happens is music. So when I think of music, sometimes a new character can pop into my mind and be like, oh, this, this 
character likes this song and I wonder why. And then, so that kind of is the first thing that comes into play. So music is quite important. And um, then, then what follows is actually the costume. So costume is probably the, the most important thing in my work. And that's why the costumes are individual artworks in their own right as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like about clothing, making the personality and making a body act the way it does. Uh, Porik, I'm happy to hand over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, like with a lot of the contributors today, I was really struck by how the tactility of the garments that you're making and how I can imagine I'm losing a lot of the sort of textures and the even the, vi the visuals that you're using by seeing this through a screen. But something I wanted to ask you about really was just your use of pornography in the, in like the, the, um, the gloves and the mandalas that you make out of, uh, there seems to be, I was thinking a lot about Kosi Fanny Tutti and her, her use of similar imagery. And I'm just curious about your sort of motivation. Um, is there an attempt to sort of subvert the, the sort of um, what's at play in those images or uh, is something else happening there? Maybe you could just explain that sort of very loaded imagery a little bit. So I'm always thinking about performativity and gender and identity. And then I was thinking about kind of the online experience as well. And we're so used to pornography now. It is very much like something that's part of our everyday lives. Everybody's got somebody who watches it or they watch it. And um, this is kind of changing the way that we perform in uh, an intimate way and with each other, like in bed and things like that. So I'm think talking about this like how we're performing images, but we're also performing pornographic images as well. And the gloves are just like, they're supposed to be humorous, but they're also like a play on um, how that, 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 that exactly that we are putting on these gloves, we're putting on this, these images and performing them exactly like that. And the gloves are very sensual as well because they're made out of silk and they're a play off, they're hybrid, everything, all the costumes are hybrids and they're hybrid of, something very delicate and elegant like evening opera gloves and then mix in with these pornographic images so they're just they're very sensual and they mean a lot of things but it's mainly about the perf performing image images of pornography and it's a combination of found images and then also uh, self-portraiture collaged into that or is it all found Oh, all of this is found. Yeah, all of that was just porn image, porn pornographic images that I enjoyed. Are you familiar with the work of Cosi Fani Tutti? Um, I know Cosi Fani Tutti only because of the Pandragine, and I actually don't know much of their work, but I know I know they were in a band with um, with Genesis Piorge. Yeah. It might be an interesting, the work that she was doing, like from the, particularly when in the 80s, when she started actually using her own body in pornography as a way of sort of subverting the male gaze. I think that would be a really interesting um, subject to look at. Okay. Okay, and that's another great. Person, Thank you. Another artist who I kept thinking of when I was looking through the material is, do you know the French artist Orlan? She uses no. sort of body modification quite a lot in her work, um, but also, I guess, challenging these conventions that women are forced to conform to, which is predominantly like usually a misogynistic or male gaze. And I think she's one of the first artists in the last in the 20th century to really get into body modification uh, in her work. Uh, so another, I think, really interesting reference who is sometimes, I think, overlooked a little bit in terms of European art history. And amazing costumes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll look, I'll look those artists. Thank you so much. Uh, Marie, Egan, do you want me? I, I can jump in here again. Great. Okay, cool. Uh, so Marie is here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, hi, nice to meet hi. you. Nice um, so this, this project for me was really well considered and uh, just uh, there was a very clear kind of uh, uh, plan in this work, which was really, really nice to see. Um, but I suppose one of the first things that struck me, and I suppose it's from my own uh, 
experience of maybe producing work and working uh, with theatre and dancers uh, and also visual artists is just the logistics around creating a piece of work like this and how you kind of managed it in terms of you had a director of photography and all of this and a choreographer and all of this other expertise came in around the work so I suppose I, I'm interested in and maybe hearing you speak a little bit about that um, and that process for you is it is it something you had done before or was this uh, was the plan for this piece very much thought out with all of these people involved as a new thing that you would take on and the, what, what, the latter thing, what you just said, I, I've never collaborated before. Um, I, I wanted to challenge myself. Uh, and even with restrictions, I was even more determined. It made me more determined just to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, I was very inspired by Dervla Walsh. She's an Irish director. She, she made a short film called I'm Roger Casement. And um, my director of photography, Patrick Jordan, he shot that short film. Um, so that was one of the reasons I chose to work with Patrick Jordan. Um, and he's got an amazing kit as well, that that always helps, you know, he's got a, a drone and all the different camera lenses. Um, to, be, to, to be honest, the choreography was something I did underestimate the time involved and the work involved. Yeah. Um, and choreographers are extremely busy in, in this lockdown, which I was pleasantly surprised to hear. They're all so busy, I guess it's a niche area. Um, but I had to kind of work with two choreographers because one had childcare issues, but that was the, the hardest part was trying to get a choreographer on board, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actors are very hungry for work. Um, so, that, you know, but to find an actor with contemporary dance, with a contemporary dance background was, was difficult as well. But um, Film Networks Ireland is a great, it's a great resource. It's very easy to kind of find people um, but I, I wanted to go into moving image. My background is kind of sound installation and, and photography. And I, I wanted to challenge myself with this particular um, project. I wanted to say more. And I think that moving image just gives you that ability to say a lot more than perhaps still image, you know? Um, so it's something I wanted to venture into and I threw myself into it. It was a huge challenge. Um, I. I <laughs> I went way over budget, even with the contingency plan. Um, we worked around the lockdown. Um, it was shot in British Bay on the 7th of May. Um, it, restrictions had eased. But yeah, um, it was extremely challenging, but at the same time, extremely rewarding. And you're performing in this piece. So, I am. Um, uh, so that's another challenge. Had you done that before? Because that's another challenge in itself. Um, I always liked dance. I've never really performed live or, you know, performed being filmed as such. So that was kind of another um, another challenge for me to, to perform in front of the lens. I'm usually behind it. So, yeah. yeah, that was a first for me performing in front of it. I mean, I've always loved to dance, but contemporary dance, I've watched it. I've never really tried it as such. Um, but yeah, that was a first for me as well. Uh, then. The other thing I suppose when I think of, so dance on film is a very different thing to kind of experience in dance uh, in real life, I suppose in real life or where there is a dancer in front of you. Um, and so I'm wondering about, you know, you performed this on the beach and that was an experience on it, uh, in itself. And then you're bringing it to film. And I know just from reading the notes that you, that you had submitted that they, there were lots of different decisions uh, or there were lots, there are lots of different things coming to your mind in terms of how this will be presented. Um, and I think dance is one of those things where you, you really want to express, um, you want to express so much of the movement because it's a, like with dance, it's literally your, this part of your body is connected to this knuckle, like it, it just, everything is connected. So uh, to, to capture it in film is a tricky thing and then to present it is, a, is, is tricky as well. So I'm wondering if you could just chat a little bit about just the things that are running through your head about presentation um, and how it might be situated. Yeah, I mean, the, the editing process, I had so much to work with and I had to narrow it down um, to be honest, I just went with my gut feeling on it. Um, I mean, it's it's an autobiographical story, so it's 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 about a, a very special person I met in India in two thousand and eleven, who's passed away. 
So I just had to stay true to the story as best as I could. And there was certain, there was a lot of repetitive uh, movement in the dance. So I, 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 I kind of eliminated, you know, some movement that was, you know, repeating itself. Um, and yeah, I just tried to, to, to stay true to the story as best as I could. Um, but it was difficult to answer your question. It was difficult to try and um, decide which should, you know, which movement should be included, which shouldn't. Um, I, I, in the end, uh, after I submitted this for assessment, I did contact a professional editor. I just wanted an objective eye over what I had edited. And actually he, he said to me, your edit wasn't bad at all, but mm -hmm. then he shortened it down. Some of the dance moves that were shot in kind of, um, you know, 50 frames per second, it's kind of slow motion. So he implemented some speed ramping into the imagery. So it's speeding it up and then slowing it down and it just shortens the footage. Because you, I kind of had to think of the audience as well. I didn't want a film essay. I didn't want a long film. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted something kind of under 20 minutes. Uh, and the final edit, we got it down to just over 11 minutes. Sorry, just have a quick before we move on to the next um, contributor. I was just struck by in your work and also just uh, throughout, uh, whether it be the representation of the body or in this instance, the actual use of the body, there is a very sort of predominant strand throughout all uh, most of the participants of just the kind of foregrounding of the human body in certain ways. And I was really struck looking at this. I was thinking a lot uh, about uh, an artist who uses dance primarily, who died a couple of weeks ago, who I encourage you all to look at, Anna Halperin. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. She's sort of a pioneer, I guess, of modern dance, um, but particularly looking at how the notation that's used around dance can be sort of trans translated into other aspects of life. I think she was a hundred when she died uh, wow. two weeks ago, um, but it would be a really interesting sort of touchstone because a lot of the, I'd be very curious to talk to the choreographer who devised a lot of this because it looks like they're using some form of notation. I'm really curious to know how could this be repeated? And if so, what was the index or notation used to sketch out the sequence of movements? Maybe it was, I, I, I showed her excerpts of my thesis um, because my thesis is based around memory, place, um, and it's a tribute work. So she actually got us to improvise all of the movement. Right. So I, I went through the, the, the story with her particular day. She said, is, was there any particular time you had in India that was very traumatic? And I, I just talk, talked her through different experiences while I was there. And then she got me and um, my actor to improvise. Um, our own movement. So we, we had to come up with the moves ourselves. And she pushed us. She was like, you know, she was, it was quite grueling. But I mean, and, and she asked us to do movement that would come natural. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, my actor is very agile. He's, he's, he's very fit. Some of his movement, and it's, he's very masculine. He brings, he brings a masculinity to, to this contemporary dance, which I really like. Uh, and my movement is very feminine and we're not really dancing in sync. We're just bringing our own style to the dance, but it's improvised movement. OK, so it couldn't necessarily be repeated as it is. It would have to be a sort of organic version of this. Well, no, we can repeat it as it's shown on the film, but the initial move, we, we come up with that move ourselves. OK, you know, so it's um. I hope that answers your question. So it initially, does, yeah, no, it was, but we can repeat it as it's shown on the film from memory. Yeah, that's clear. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Marie. Thanks. Um, you go first this time. I'll, I'll uh, Louis, um, I was really curious uh, uh, to ask you just a few questions about this. Um, there is sort of this tendency in the, in the like it's great to see this work installed because I can get a much greater sense of it than looking at still images. Um, but there seems to be this tendency to sort of interrupt the, the photographic process. So they're like a kind of reflexive, um, almost Brechtian uh, process here where you're constantly interrupting your own photographic process. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, of course. Um... So I, I guess the work that I, I showed you here and, and that I, I submitted for the MFA came from like a long kind of standing body of research into the history of commercial forestry in Ireland. Uh, and I've, I've kind of taken a, a lot of photographs across the country of, of these kind of commercial 
forestry sites um, and I, I seem to just kind of be almost repeating myself uh, in, in the kind of photographs I was taking and the, and the kinds of locations I was going to and then in the, in the kind of in the middle of lockdown uh, when, when it wasn't really possible to, to revisit these sites I started thinking about using photography as a way to to kind of revisit these sites uh, within my own studio um, and then I guess I was drawing on my on my history as a freelance museum photographer uh, documenting um, artworks and exhibitions and in, in galleries and museums um, so I started kind of installing my work um, and kind of recreating that they weren't quite life they weren't quite life size but they were an approximation of life size kind of depending on on scale and, and distance so i was recreating these scenes using um color photocopier and, and wallpaper paste um and I, I really like in the in the process of um kind of making these images and re-photographing them i i kind of decided that I, I was kind of interested in the act of making a photograph itself. Uh, it, like the, the subject of photography became as much a subject as, as this kind of history of commercial forestry. Um, and the kind of the mechanics of a photograph, uh, the, the, the way a camera can, can uh, the way a camera processes light in terms of a light comes through a lens and it hits a series of, of mirrors called a pent pentaprism in a camera. So I, I started using these these mirrors in the studio to to reflect different work back into itself, and and then and then the work kind of progressed into uh, you know parts of the camera or the tripod or my hand would would come into a shot, um, and really I started thinking about you know the agency that a photographer has or or the agency that you have when when you're taking photographs. Um, there's you know there's a certain set of rules that that need to be either followed or broken or, or a, a certain set of decisions that need to be made, whether consciously or unconsciously by, by you or the camera. But there, there's this kind of, there's a parameter set by, by, by photography as, as a way of making images. Um, and I think photographs are so common nowadays. I mean, we, we really, we, we, we take photographs to remember shopping lists. We take photographs to to aid us in in our everyday lives, that we we kind of forget that that photography is is really a thing, in of in and of itself. Um, so I was kind of curious to kind of uh, reflect on on the agency that that I have as a photographer, uh, and, and to kind of maybe implicate myself back into that work and and think about the the kind of the the history of of photography and the history of the photographer as well, like this kind of individual within within that history. Yeah, I was thinking um, so, a lot when I was looking at these images of the, the sort of almost like an ethnographic uh, concern with the uh, the documentation of these, I don't know if you can call this invasive species because they're not sure they're planted, but they're not indigenous. Uh, they, they actually are considered an invasive species because of the rate that they spread on their own. So, okay. yeah. But I was thinking a lot about just to, uh, someone mentioned Roger Casement uh, 10 minutes ago and I don't know if you know, but he, when he was in the Congo, he brought back to Ireland uh, some plants, which are actually now in the, they're in the botanical gardens in Dublin. And yeah, uh, yeah. So that struck me maybe as a, like a, a kind of relevant to this somehow in that there's obviously tying in of the body uh, with these and, and, the, and the personal narrative with then these, uh, you know, tree species so but you knew you knew that already of the the casement uh, plants i would love to see them yeah there's a, i think there's three entries in in the in the national herbarium which is in the botanic gardens uh, i think actually there's there's a collection of coffee beans as well that that casement either collected or was given at some stage uh, that are that are housed there um but yeah there's there's this kind of strange kind of parallel in in the history of photography uh that kind of coincides with a lot of these kind of colonial expeditions and these kind of um, this kind of uh, kind of system of exploration and and kind of you know um, you know you know quote unquote discovery of of you know non native species uh, and and photography as well like you know photography kind of uh, came into existence in around eighteen eighteen forty um, so uh, yeah I was kind of aware of these kind of coexisting timelines uh, that that kind of subtly overlap every now and then yeah and also methodologies in terms of not just colonialism but also eugenics i think if you look at a lot of early 20th century photographer photography it's used also in these kind of very questionable ethically ideas of 
measuring species or, or different oh, yeah. strains. Uh, I guess August Sander, is that his name? The, the photographer? Yeah. yeah. So, so there seems to be also a kind of thread of this in your, in your photos. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, uh, like I, I studied photography uh, many years ago and I, I work as a photographer uh, freelance. I, I make photographs uh, as an artist. So like I, I feel like kind of deeply embedded within within photography. Um, and I think kind of many different aspects of, of that history and, and, and of the practice of photography, I think at this stage is now now kind of making its way in, into the work that I'm making. Uh, like maybe if you go back maybe five or six years, I felt really, um, I felt really concerned about keeping all of these different parts of my photographic kind of practice and career uh, kind of separate. Um, you know, I felt like my my freelance, uh, you know, museum photography needed to be kept over in in one section, and and my my art practice had to be kept in another section. And and over the last number of years, I, I realized that that's that's really the wrong approach, and and that. Uh, it's it's really it's not not only is it okay but it's it's kind of encouraged for these um, for these different types of uh, photographic practices to kind of um, collide and kind of intertwine. And like uh, um, just uh, Emma, do you want to continue or can I ask a question? No, no go first. Yeah, I had one, but yeah. I think he's kind of yeah. Just I'm just I'm just curious. Like I'm sure everyone who's here today encountered a lot of obstacles, right, on this course of action and I just know in you mentioned in the material you submitted that there was this aborted 16 millimeter uh, film and I'm just curious to know like as the last few months have kind of panned out is is, is it maybe is that still something you want to pursue, pursue the 16 millimeter moving image or uh... yeah yeah I mean that that was really just the start of something so and again it's it's kind of touching on the same type of approach uh, in that it was this kind of 16 millimeter motion film uh, of, of actually Eve, who's, who's uh, uh, in, in the class, um, uh, kind of embodying this kind of archivist uh, persona. I actually kind of saw her as uh, this, the, the kind of almost like the, the figure of Augustine Henry's wife. So Augustine Henry is this very uh, esteemed, famous botanist, uh, Irish botanist, uh, who revolutionized uh, uh, contemporary forestry. Um, but the Augustine Henry collection, which is in the National Herbarium, was collated posthumously by his wife. Um, so I kind of, I, I kind of, in the back of my mind, I, I, I just, I, I wanted to kind of make a piece of work that that looked at her as a, as a person. Um, and so, so what what the sixteen mil film is is actually Eve going through these photographs that I'd taken of the collection. So again, it's kind of, you know, a, a, a moving, uh, a moving image of these photographs that I've, I've already made. So, um, I mean, I've, I've, I have the, I have the film, it's been processed. Um, I've, I've looked at it as, as a static object. I just haven't, uh, haven't unfortunately been able to watch it because I don't have a, a projector. Thank you. Thanks. My question was actually about that film as well. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, watch this space uh, is my my second answer to that. Um, so yeah, I, one, once I once I get to view the um, view the footage, uh, I I think I'll I'll continue making more uh, sixteen mil. Okay, uh, Vanessa, Vanessa's up next. Um, I'll I'll jump in on this one for if that's uh, of course, absolutely please, yeah. Yeah, uh, Vanessa, these are, are really, really accomplished paintings. They're, they're really beautiful to look at. Um, I, I studied art history um, um, way back, um, but just looking through these, the references to different, I suppose, painters and moments in art history are really, really strong. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, uh, your process and uh, where you were drawing the ideas from and um, how art history really, how, uh, how the important part that art history plays in your in your practice. If you could talk a little bit more about that. Okay, yeah, no, it definitely does. That makes me happy that that is noticeable. Um, I think I, I was doing a lot of um, painting where I wasn't really drawing on that outside of technique. Like I was using art historical techniques um, but I wasn't really using the imagery that I loved from art history. Um, and then over the summer, there kind of came a moment where um, I just decided to kind of insert myself into these things that I loved and appreciated. Um, and for example, in, in this image, 
um, the harvesters um, by Bruegel. Um, I would I have a tendency to copy paintings anyways and drawings. So just kind of using that idea of copying something. So I, I copied his wheat in the background, the harvesting. And I, I kind of just bring in images in that way as I'm doing something, I, I'll think of um, an art historical uh, picture that I would, I would like to use. Um, like the hat in that comes from Brigitte Bardot, <laughs> but it also comes from um, the, um, uh, oh, I can't even think what they're called. Um, they're manuscripts, you know, illuminated manuscripts. You know, you would see peasants working in the fields and they, they would be wearing the white peasant blouses and um, the, the straw hats. But also there was that image of Brigitte Bardot in kind of a film still in a, a so film also brings in as well to, into my work. Um, I like the um, I like the intensity sort of film brings a sort of implied narrative going on that you don't a suspense that you know what is going on. Um, there's a there's a kind of a reading of these images. So uh, I, there was a book that I, I, I really loved when I was in college. It's uh, Hall's uh, Dictionary of uh, Subjects and Symbols in Art. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really reading into, you know, uh, kind of medieval and Renaissance paintings and what the things, you know, that the small objects in a in an image might mean or be alluding to. Um, and it's just a fascinating dictionary of things that you, once you had this knowledge, you were kind of going back to images and you were reading them in a very different way. And that's something in your images, the more I was looking at them, the more I was kind of going back to maybe the one before and finding different references within the image. So uh, I think that's something when you're seeing a number of them, uh, together is really, really interesting because you are finding the film references. Well, I suppose if you have the knowledge, you are finding the film references, you're finding uh, the art history references and maybe popular culture and different things kind of uh, within an image that is painted in a very particular way. So uh, I find them really, really engaging in that sense. Um, so yeah, well done. Um, oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So that wasn't a question, that was just me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Or do you want to take over? Yeah, I was um, I was reminded of this painter pa Paula Modison Becker, who uh, mm -hmm. some of the some of the self portraits really reminded me of hers. But I also it occurred to me when I was looking at these that um, it, there's a sort of almost narcissism narcissism built into this because you're painting yourself almost obsessively, and then mm -hmm. that suggests there's actually a splitting of the self into multiple selves. So there's obviously sort of a Jungian investigation or self analysis going on. Um, and I'm curious to know where that's leading you in terms of both uh, in the studio when you are rendering yourself on the canvas every day, does that lead you into sort of a, is it a form of self-analysis? Well, yes, unintentionally. Um, but yeah, I definitely, um, I'm constantly going down the Jungian path, um, which is very Jungian. You know? So like while, while I'm doing it, um, things, come up and I realize I've been repeating certain images, including myself over and over again, um, like as in a, in a very, you know, narcissistic, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, it literally as in a desire to look at myself over and over again. Um, and it does become an analysis and that, um, Emma Lucy had mentioned the symbols and I think the repetition yeah. of symbols as well, um, using primordial imagery and medieval imagery that kind of reveals more about myself than the image of myself, you know, um, why I'm sort of looking at those certain things and repeating those images. And thinking about that self-analysis has kind of even led me down to a less artistic path and more of a neuroscience path. It's made me think about how we, we kind of operate as humans in this, this self-replication, why we're doing this over and over again. Um, that's something obviously I don't have the answer to, <laughs> but I find that connection of, of symbols and myth and science more connected than you would think, you know? I think it's all connected. I mean, it's all yeah. sort of part of the microcosm versus macrocosm are the yeah. same. So yeah. I also really enjoyed looking at your paintings. Thank you. Thank you. I hope Thanks. to see them in the flesh someday. Thanks. So Anne-Marie Kerwin is next. Is Anne-Marie here? I am. Hi, Hi. Marie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Hi. you too. Hi. So, 
Uh, I'll jump in. I don't. Or sorry, Cor, do you want to go first? If you go first. Okay. So uh, this was, I suppose, this was interesting to me. as thinking about just the the moment uh, where we've been in the terms of lockdown and being kind of. Uh, encased in something or uh, trapped or isolated and your project really spoke to all of those ideas um, and then the other things that were coming through my mind when I was reading the, the information about your work was just you know the who was featuring it it was you your husband and the and the dog the things that were proximate to you during this time as well and um, so I, I suppose I'd love to hear a little bit more about the process and how it unfolded in a time when we were very much, I suppose, within not necessarily a queue, but within a very restricted uh, in environment um, and how that might have fed into the work. Um, I suppose I'm kind of like multimedia, but my main my main interest would be around sculpture. So the, the studio's practice and the sculpture would be um, to work in the workshops would be very important, but because of COVID, obviously everything changed rapidly. And um, I was trying to visualize a way that I I could follow through on my main idea, but I knew it was going to change. So um, I live in Kilkenny, so my back garden became my studio, the bedroom, um, the bathroom. So it was trying to figure out a way of the containment, but like we were all contained and um, I still wanted it to be tactile. I'm very, very interested in, in, in the tactile part of it. So like a lot of it would be research based, but I was going down rabbit holes and I decided that I really liked the rabbit hole. So I was going deeper down, but um, it's um, it became site, site responsive work and um, Obviously, the, the reason my husband came into it, the whole idea of it is um, uh, my husband has sleep apnea and what it's like to live with someone that um, has sleep apnea without the device and the sound of the breathing and the consequences of that um, if you don't wear the machine and then the process of, of getting the machine and um, almost like sleeping with the dark Vader, but then getting used to it. So. Breeding would have always been um, part of, my dad was a coal miner. He went down mines when he was 14. And I come from Castle Coma, which is, was a coal mine town. So there's history behind that, the Wansfords and the, the coal mine. And, um, and I um, began to think about the skin and skin as a boundary. So to be inside the, 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 the cube of the space, for that it related as well to me that, you're in a confined space, um, you know, like the, the structure of buildings that if it's a prison cell, it's, it's it, the government or it's decided on, on what space you have. Um, you lose control over that, that, that choice of space. And um, the fact that the image true, when you take a photograph, the image true, the, the actual material and then I used um, a touch me device, which I ordered from the UK, which is like, um, it, it transmits the um, skin to skin. Um, it didn't work that well. It'll, it'll go through vegetables and all other sorts of materials, not, not great through the actual cloth. So I had to find out a way. So it's just, just basically, it had to transition into video work. And um, I'm so used to working with something that's really messy and tactile and I really let the work do its own thing but when you're obviously doing video work and it's a whole different um it's a whole different ball game so I'm not sure if that answers the question or no but that's that's just uh, that's a thing that's been a thing for people over the, over the last while and I think Porik and I were chatting about this with some in relation to somebody else's work earlier this morning if if your work is haptic in that sense and if it, if you're if you're very much somebody who's exploring materials and visit, placing materials in front of people to emote something then that, that's been a very difficult and challenging thing for artists who work in that way over the last while um, but it looks like you're resolving this work that the cube is there, that the, 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 like the, the description around it was, a, you know, it, it was there in the sense that you have these performers inside it, there's this membrane that you were creating and you describe just the voyeur and the, that other person kind of coming across it and how, what the kind of sensation that they would bring to it. Um, so, but the, but the, the thing that falls short then is you need to put it in front of the people and that's where we've just been in that kind of 
that's the space, that's the tricky space that we've been in for the last while. And, yeah. and some, things, some things don't translate to film, that's the thing. So, um, yeah. The best part, I guess, is that it opens up so much more because I began to look at Andrea Fraser, Fraser and then, you know, obviously the frottage and, and as kids in school, we do rubbings, but then the sexual implication of that. Um, if someone was naked behind it, um, then the tactile from outside, how, how much do we want to explore? What, what type of audience can I put in front of um, child friendly or whatever, you know? So uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. Okay, thank you. Thank no, I just, I would totally resound with what you said. It's one of these instances where um, the conditions of the last year have like prevented the really necessary parts of work becoming impossible. This is one of those like works that is fundamentally built upon human contact. I'm just curious to know, like, do you think this would have, this work would have come about were it not for uh, pandemia? Or do you, do you think you would, have, you would have found yourself working in this way anyway? I definitely don't think the cube would have come about because I was initially, um, you know, it was about the breathing and, and endurance and how long I could hold my breath in the bathtub and um, a lot of seaweed and nature came into it. So, no, I would not have made that cube only for the pandemic, which I'm delighted. That's a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Emma, will I uh, jump in? Yeah, you can. I'm hoping you don't take my question on this one, but go for it. <laughs> um, I, I'll telepathically try not to, to, yeah, no, it's okay. to take your question. Um, yeah, I'm just really interested in some of the, the uh, imagery uh, here. I'm just trying to find my, my notes. Um, yeah, so... Um, Actually, do you want to, do you want to, I'm just, I'm having some difficulty here getting my, getting my. Yeah, yeah, I'll go first. Martin is here. Are you here, Martin? I can't see my screen at the moment. So if you want to go ahead until I pull it up here, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, go first. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hi, Martina. Hi. Uh, nice to, nice to meet you. Um, so uh, I thought this work was really interesting and engaging at the, what I was supposed the first thing I wondered about was these humanoids and these sculptures and if these, at what point did these arrive? Were the paintings, uh, were these something that came kind of while you were in the process of making these, these all of these paintings um, or were they there before the paintings? I wanted to know at what point in your practice did they arrive? Uh, do you mean the, uh, when the sculpture arrived or? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the paintings were first and uh, um, I think while I was making the, the paintings, I um, because I'm interested in protest, I was I was looking at the, at the protest and in my research for the for the thesis, uh, I kind of started to be interested in the space where the protest occurs, and then these ideas of um, that came from from my background in architecture came to the came to the uh, surface. So I started thinking about walls and. Uh, the significance of, of uh, symbolic and the physical significance of walls. And then, so the sculpture kind of relates to the walls. Um, so it's it's made from, from the common building materials um, and it's it's like a wall or like a barricade. Uh, and even though it's porous, it's, it still blocks the, blocks the movement. Uh, but yeah, the paintings were first and it was, it was kind of gradually, I started making these, um, these cube um, shapes on, or, or, or uh, just painting um, lines that would represent something that is blocking the, um, the humanoid, uh, the humanoid uh, shapes. Mm -hmm. So then I kind of thought, okay, well, let's, let's maybe try to build it and see, and see how would that um, uh, come about. So, so, the, so the sculpture is something in between um, a creature and, um, and a barricade or a wall. I, I, I think they're great. I, I like that, you know, you describe them as these kind of rickety and um, weak creatures inside in, inside in the paintings and they kind of, they emerge out of the paintings and I think they, they, they look rickety and, but there's, there's, there's 
fierce personality in them as well. So there, there's a kind of a strength that, they're, that they gain from kind of jumping out of the painting, which I think is really nice and really playful. And it looks- like the, the, Sorry, sorry, I didn't know you were, there's a slight delay, continue, sorry. No, go for it, you go for it, yeah. No, I just, well, I, the, the work really it seemed to me to be a lot about totalitarian uh, sort of, uh, ideologies uh, in terms of the emphasis on marching feet mm -hmm. and also these structures look sort of like collapsed almost ruinous um, architecture uh, so I'm curious just to, to, to know there's obviously like Philip Guston references there but also maybe Hans Belmer Robert Gober um, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about the use of the legs, because I'm curious about, again, the body keeps coming back today in various ways. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about your choice of that particular limb as, uh, as an awkward thing. Yeah, I was, uh, this is something that kind of came natural to me and I started painting legs and then I was, and I was asking myself a question, why legs? Uh, and I think when I think about a protest, um, and I think about crowds, I, I, I see the legs. But then also, um, I think I was thinking about something that it's more, um, because they don't have a, they don't have heads. So it's, it's almost like they're pushing because they have to, there's no other way for them. That's the only, the only way they can, um, they know. So there's something more um, conditioned or primal in, in what they're doing. Um, and it also they're, they're silent, so they don't have mouths. So, so there's something kind of there's something again weird and awkward um, about that that they that they can't um, they can they, they can actually can't um, shout what they're pushing about. So I think it was adding to um, um, to this idea that I had that it's uh, that there is something that um, we as humans do that we keep pushing. Mm -hmm. um, there's an, an artist who I was really reminded of, uh, Alina Shepachnikov, um, a, a Polish artist who I would encourage you to look at. Again, she uses these sort of disembodied limbs. Um, I think I've put her name in the chat on the side. I don't know if it's popped up, but I was really reminded of her work when I was looking at yours. That's great. I, I'm going to look at her. There was something else in this, in this work. You, you spoke about walls and the positioning of wall, like the, the, the paintings are installed in a certain way, but the walls within that installation are important too. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was, I think I was, um, I was interested in, um, in uh, pointing to the walls as a part of the, um, part of the exhibition. Uh, that they that they have certain power over over the movements of the visitors, mm. and I was um, and walls and and the sculpture kind of play a role in here. So the sculpture is is kind of like a wall, and and I think I've, I've, this is something that I'm going to continue on doing. Is it's it's building something that it's kind of like a wall, but it's it's stopping the viewer to from seeing the, the work properly. So there is something that is frustrating in, in there. Mm -hmm. um for the viewer um and then yeah so the so the so the work that we that it's there on on the dark um painted wall it's 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 kind of like yeah it's 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 almost like a different thing but it's not so you standing uh, in looking at that view you can kind of see how it relates to the other room which is completely different to that yeah um, thank you thanks yeah. I didn't mean to repeat that name four times in the chat, by the way. It looks slightly psychotic behavior going on there. I just, it was an error. We believe you, we believe you, Borg. <laughs> you thought we weren't getting it. Um, shall I begin? Yeah, go for it. Um, so is it, is it Barbara or Barra? Both is right. Hello, nice oh, to see okay. you. Okay. Um, so um, I was really curious just to ask a few questions about the, the process, because one of the points that was um, included in the material that you sent along was that you had to sort of amend some sections because of the sort of, uh, you, that you met with resistance basically in the process of wanting to use some of the Czechoslovakian material, the Czech material. Could you talk a little bit about that, the archival Czech footage and what the, what the resistance you met was? I'm really curious to know. 
yeah, of course, no problem. I would like to say also that if we get interrupted, it's not really my fault because I have a child downstairs and is really well behaved until now. <clears throat> so no um, I made a film during the lockdown and I did everything myself. And my main inspiration was Mark Leckie's Dream English Kid, where, where he found uh, some footage and he tried to represent his memories. And I thought that that's brilliant because during that lockdown, also being on my own with my child just kind of sparked something in me in me really deep uh, rooted in me uh, and that's my memories and history and all and I really found that found footage online I used it um, amended some of it um, and then one with um, it's like a fairy tale sort of animation I thought that was the problem I do not have any any proof of it but as I was submitting the film uh, to film festivals and it was uh, accepted to some and it was screened in London as well already uh, but somebody who lives abroad would not know that that is a fairy tale for kids for 7 p.m okay every evening bedtime story um, so they got back to me via email saying it is one of the three possibilities why we did not accept it and one of it was the you know, not the royalties, but the copyrights, basically, because I bought right. the music for it as well. So that was fine. Uh, so I, I t maybe it took two hours to make it right, to make it dark. There's that kind of dark um, black and white uh, stars um, with, the, with the sound I made myself uh, singing. But then the next day I got an email saying it was accepted. So maybe I only, it was only in my mind that was the problem, but I really had to face everything what could come possibly. So I included it in my, um, the, the portfolio I made for MFA saying that, it, that there was a possibility of that being rejected because of the copyrights. I understand. I'm curious to know maybe, was there also this uh, intentional weaving in of sort of nuclear paranoia um, is that sort of, do you recognize that as having resonances with the contemporary moment in terms of, um, I guess, the crisis of the last year and a half, 18 months, and the sort of nuclear fear? Do you think there's analogies between the two? And is that something you're weaving in to this Absolutely. work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Yep. Uh, uh, my mum was stuck here with me from March for four months. She was unable to fly back. And I did not experience bigger fear than when we did not know what that was we were dealing with. She started coughing. I'm a single mom. What will happen with a child and so on and so on. And all that fear, I think, sparked something. What I experienced when I was four, that was my first fear for life when she told us that Chernobyl happened. We, nobody knew anything like, is it contagious? Is everybody going to die? Even though we were in Czech, Czechoslovakia back then, and it was far, far away, but nobody knew anything. So maybe that was the, the other spark, what I carried with me o o over these years. And Mark Leckie's film helped me with, OK, I'll find it. I'll try to do something with it, put it in a big saucepan and just uh, cook a soup out of it. And that, that's the film. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, the hiding in the grain, I, I suppose that the, the thoughts that were running through my head reading it was just this idea of parallels and how we live here and how others that we know live elsewhere and that we're, we're so closely connected but live in very, very different ways. Um, but also this, I, the storytelling and the weaving that Cork has uh, kind of described already. Um, I was watching, and I think you, you've kind of described this already, I was watching and wondering about where where all of these parts, where all these um, parts of film came from and how you gathered them, how you collected them. Um, and I thought it, it just in terms of the process, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in that. Um, uh, so, but I think you've kind of covered it in what you were talking to Pork about. The other thing I was thinking about is just, you know, in terms of the way that elements from the past, they, they, they persist and they return. Um, and this is, I suppose, in terms of hauntology and ghosts, they, 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 they come back and they persist with us. Like your, your image of hiding in the grain. Um, I don't know if that was a good memory or a safe place, but I, I grew up in a farm where we used to jump into piles of grain all like as kids during the summer. It was, it's a really nice childhood memory um, and a very safe 
well, my mother would have said differently, but it felt to us a very safe and innocent kind of a thing to do. So I, I, I really liked that imagery, I suppose, from a personal sense, but I think you'll understand your, your hiding the grain was different to my hiding in the grain. So I just I really enjoyed those kind of parallels, I suppose. Um, but maybe to go back to the, the how you archived and how you, how you brought all of this, all the different types of footage that you have in this film together. Because um, that's a huge task. There's, there's lots of difference and variation. It's woven together really well. Um, and some of it is film that you've made and some of it is film that you've gathered from elsewhere. Um, so just even in terms of time and, you know, what know. Is around that. I'm, I'm interested in how that went for you. Yeah, it was a bit mental, but um, I'd say less than 10% is found footage online that's to do with history of Czechoslovakia, Chernobyl, and that what you see in, on a small TV, which then I, on a green screen, I kind of green screened in. Green screened in. Um, and the rest is my shooting uh, in August when we could travel uh, because I lived on Cherkin Island, County Cork, for two and a half years. And I lost the footage for the time being when I was shooting around the place. So I revisited those places where really, really were rich, visually rich. Um, so that's the main footage of the abandoned dwellings and the nature. What I used as my homeland now, as in to represent Ireland, mm. where I belong now. And then 2013, I think I shot my friends in the pub where you could still smoke. And I, I did not know what to do with the footage, even though I was walking around, they're all lesbians. And I was asking, why are you not with a man? But that project didn't just come about. So I used the footage to represent my vanishing friendships as such. So that's most of it, 90% of it is, is my own footage, um, being it now recent or uh, during past years and then it just once you start it just with the core of that memory found online it just starts growing and growing and it kind of uh, it, it just it's alive and it tells you what what, what it needs and what it, it wants mm -hmm. um, so I can't really say exactly because it's a different story no but it's it, but that's a process though what you're yeah. describing in terms of how gathering and holding and keeping until something might find it, find another place or find its way into a story so that's that's interesting too um, thank you thank you thanks so Eve uh, or Anna do you want to start or will I jump in uh, you can jump in yeah um, well I really enjoyed looking at this work and uh, all of the work but uh, Indeed, I looked looked at everyone and enjoyed everyone's work, uh, but I was taken by the sort of level of storytelling that um, the different sort of narrative modes that are at play here. And there is a sort of I, I, I was very taken by this kind of poetic use also of the actual biro as a, as a tool, both one that has its own narrative, which is then built back into the, the artworks themselves. So there's clearly a lot of research behind all this. I'm, I'm interested to know um, how, how much of that research, is it important to you, Eve, that the viewer is aware of the sort of quite deep research and narratives that go along with this? For example, the history behind the biro, is that presented in a text that accompanies these drawings? Or is it sort of really uh, okay that the viewer isn't necessarily so aware of all this? Well, I'm inclined to feel that uh, when I put the images on display, if the viewer doesn't know anything, if the viewer just walks off the street or lands from Mars and just looks at these pictures, that's absolutely fine. If the viewer wants to know more, yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy providing the information. Um, if the viewer hears of, you know, other aspects like the viral story, from a different source and maybe connect them with this work, that's, that would be fantastic as well. So I'm pretty flexible on, you know, the viewer. If they get the, get what I'm saying through any media or yeah, media, um, then that, that suits me fine. Because really this series of uh, drawings is kind of about world history and geopolitical forces clashing and the resonances of those in the 21st century. So at least that was my reading of it. Um, and in this way, it really reminded me of this, I think he's Portuguese artist, Joao Panalva, who also creates these quite open-ended installations uh, using various elements. Of course, the viewer can interpret this subjectively, but there is a particular sort of 
map making or a plotting of these things. And um, there seems to be though like a constant juxtaposition of where images like this, where you have like iconographic historical photos and then more personal things. Can you talk a little bit about your selection process as to how you kind of, you're kind of building up an archive, right? Of drawings. How do you sort of select then what to exhibit? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, um, definitely uh, the iconic and the more personal is true. And how I select them, um, I suppose that kind of depends on, maybe it depends on the day, but um, I, do, I do like the, the concept of having a stack of them, like their presence in their own right. Um, and I like the uh, to mix that kind of iconic sort of imagery with things that are really ordinary and really personal or just really of our own every day. Um, so like that, the lobster soup, um, that's just from an experience I had, uh, but loads of people have it, it's, it's just contemporary experience. And I kind of, what I'm hoping for is that when people see all these images jumbled together or well, carefully placed together, I should say, um, that, so maybe they'll start thinking, well, you know, things are kind of all the same, because that's kind of what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose my uh, reading through the the text that um, and just uh, looking at the images and reading through the first thing that struck me was just your sheer tenacity in terms of uh, positioning the work and your your this the really lovely story that was there about looking at all these different places that you might like to 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 hang this work or to show it to people and the email conversations that you had uh, as somebody who has worked kind of site specifically and been wheeling and dealing and being in contact with people trying to get spaces opened up. I really appreciated all that information. And I'd just love to know a little bit more from you about that story, that part of this and how you wanted people to, to see this work or how you wanted to position it. Yeah, I definitely wanted people to see the work in a, in a real situation because they, they, don't, uh, they don't photograph that well. Yeah, you have an image there and it tells you what it is. But in real life, I think anyway, the drawing, it's the size, it's about A3 in size. So they're very accessible in terms of placing them in the home. They're also tactile in that the paper has texture. The pen, even though it's black ink, there's all different shades in the black ink. So it's, it's, it's interesting in that way. And also, I think people have to, I think it's better to have a kind of a personal one-to-one -one experience with an artwork and not to have, well, to try and not to have too many lenses or barriers or glass, sheets of glass between you. Um, so it's, that's important to me. So when I kind of heard that there wasn't going to be a show in the, in the form that I was expecting, I just kind of went mad and, and sort of thought, where, oh God, I have to put it somewhere that people can go see it in some form. Um, so I, the, I did approach several places, um, Liberty Hall, uh, Dublin Castle, Chester Beatty Library, uh, NCAD also would, were going to let me borrow the lift, which was, I have plans for that. Um, and Dublin Castle were so helpful. I mean, they really bent over backwards to help me that um, I've, I'm going to, I've kind of, they've kind of, uh, well, apart, not, I won't say their insistence, but their Enthusiasm means now that on the 15th of July, I'm going to have a private exhibition um, of invited people. I, don't, I haven't done this yet. It's happening on the 15th though, um, in a certain room in Dublin Castle, which is not open to the public at the moment, which uh, I'm going to use that opportunity to display the work. And I quite ironically now, the idea of having a private exhibition uh, for a limited number of people really kind of intrigues me and attracts me um, and it kind of suits this work because it was created in that situation where I was on my own, uh, I was isolating from everybody else and it was all a bit dark and gloomy um, and ordinary. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of been, in hindsight, it's sort of an adventure, but when I was doing it, it wasn't. But now it, I can look back and, and sort of smile about it. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's 
for sure a very serious result out of all that work that you did. So well done on that and getting that show. It's really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bettina is the next person. Yeah, hi. Uh, or do you want to jump in here or will I? I, I can start, yeah. Bonjour, Bettina. Bonjour. <laughs> Um, I really enjoyed looking at your work. I can I can see again. It's one of these instances in which I really wish I could be. I could actually experience its tactility because there is so almost like an insistence in your work on the materiality. And I note that you have a background in textiles, which you have sort of mutated into these installations. And this is one of the examples when I was looking through all the material today where I just really admire your pragmatism of using the shower as your, it's a little bit like Eve was saying before about how sometimes the limitations create these possibilities. And I yeah. really enjoyed this use of the shower as your uh, kind of, your um, mo the sort of sculptural format became the shower. And then there was the, uh, kind of moving things online and there was also I found a certain kind of poignance into the reality which you addressed very specifically in the material how you actually said you know you'd gone back to your childhood bedroom and I'm assuming yeah. that all those Madonna CDs were <laughs> yours like in the past so you're sort of like unpacking actually your own childhood and then integrating it into your work and um, has that been a challenging process? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because uh, when I came back uh, to France, uh, I, I found myself in a in the middle of a, a family uh, like uh, wrecking. Uh, so and I discovered a lot of family secrets, really dark uh, family secrets. So the the atmosphere was kind of heavy. And the fact that I uh, came back to my childhood home uh, in the midst um, of this tempest, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, it was just like too much for me. So I just like started to read um, my old book, like Harry Potter or um, Total Spies. I found back my old Madonna CDs. And then uh, it was a real introspection and the more I was knowing myself, the more I was able to, to build a, a new character out of it. Um, like the souvenirs were uh, like my material to, to build a new, a new self, kind of. Uh, and, and I was building this character uh, through the, the weaving as well, uh, because as you said, uh, I am a weaver before everything. <laughs> and uh, I, I really couldn't show uh, or uh, yeah, exhibit the, the sculpture, which are very organic and, and tactile. So I, I really had to find a, a solution to showcase them and uh, make people feel the material Can I, can I jump in there and just say that uh, I, I found this work really, really interesting. Uh, you could see just again, uh, like Borg was saying, we were talking to other artists, just in terms of that, you know, somebody with a real haptic sense that they, they are using materials and this is how they work. But then uh, in, in, the, in what was presented to us and the information that we had about your practice, it was like there was, there, there was these little routes of escape that you, were, that you found. So, you know, you're, you're, you're referencing the TARDIS and, you know, the TARDIS could take you anywhere. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of a joke, it's an imaginary thing. And then, you know, there's this idea of the fourth dimension of the internet. Well, you could possibly go there and maybe the things could live there and that might be the, the place for... For the work and then there was another kind of an exploration into into film and you kind of you you kind of retract that again said maybe that's not not the place so i just i i found i i there's there was a real um commitment to explore uh in in this uh are we there yeah real commitment to explore in all of this which i found really really intriguing um and then like there's a there was a, a reference to uh, this small box of uh, of items uh, collected by a child and it was like there were there were lots of different parts of your practice that were in this small box just waiting to kind of to burst out of it so um uh i think 
again, like like so many others, like I think it's that you know we we we've really spoken about online and you know the things that we've all explored over the last while. But there are points where we're just like, well, my practice, I am a weaver, and I need to I need to position this in front of people. So um, I think that's something that, that we really have to have to acknowledge. But uh, I really enjoyed reading about about your work in the different places uh, that you went to. Thank you. And all the other <laughs> so yeah. Thank so, you. Do you want to come back in there again, or are you? No, I mean, I guess we're kind of in the wrapping up stage. I really enjoyed also, Bettina, your work, and it reminded me a lot of that great Nicholas Roeg film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, which I'm sure yeah. you've probably seen. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's this idea of alienating ourselves from the familiar, which is something that's happened to really all of us over the last 18 months. And there's a whole, I think, there's a lot of possibilities really uh, in, in that at the same time it's been quite traumatic for everybody but uh, in terms of sort of the way this meeting that we've had today was sort of pitched in terms of like post uh, MA uh, I mean if I was to give any advice and I'm not really in the position to because I'm gonna I'm trying to any advice I'm giving you it's life advice I'm trying to follow myself uh, but it would just be to sort of try and embrace these limitations and kind of manage expectations and also um, one thing that Emma and I were discussing is the sort of resurgence of a more local scene that's resulted as, a, a, as, you know, as everything is shut down, it has actually made us all more aware of what's on our doorsteps. And I love that idea of what Eve was talking about in that this limitation of the smaller exhibition might actually be something that, you know, you'll talk to everyone who comes to that opening because it will be a smaller, more manageable crowd. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was just really a small reflection on, I think, some of the themes that were kind of put forward by Sarah as like touchstones for today's conversation. I think as well, the, there was a, just to go back to, but sorry, Bettina, I'm going back to something that uh, you had as well. This is, uh, this was on uh, the information that was given to us and it's a QR code that doesn't work, which yeah. I really enjoy. I just really like that. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we, we've just been bending our brains for the last while. We've taken on so much. We've learned so many new skills and we've supported each other so well in all of that. Um, and and it, it's good, but the, there is another side of it. And I, I suppose there's something that came up uh, when I was, uh, some, of the, some of you have been collaborating with others. So, you know, if you're working with a director of photography or if you're working with somebody with other skills, that's, that's, that's a very legitimate thing in terms of bringing in other people around your work to help you realize what you're trying to do. And there, there are lim like, you know, there are issues with that in terms of cost and all the rest of it. But I think, um, I think we possibly need to know a little bit more about that as well, because we're, we're in a realm where we're producing on so many different levels uh, for so many different platforms. Um, and we have to make choices around that. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there are people with skills who can can kind of help out with a lot of things. Um, like I, I, you know, from my experience working with artists, they, 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 one of the exceptional skills that an artist has is this kind of capacity to do it themselves and figure it out, uh, which is a phenomenal thing. Um, but there's another side of it where you can you can collaborate and work with others, um, and uh, that's also a, a really really great thing as well. Um, and just something that in the in the topic, you know, when we were like Pork said, we came together around ideas to do with the kind of the collective and the community and what's happened over the last while. Uh, when you finish an MA, it's a really funny thing. You've been in a really tight group of people and then you're out into the world. Um, but I think there's a there's a kind of a little grace period where you still stay together for a while to support each other. And um, so that's that's to be enjoyed for another little while as well, I think. Um, so um, yeah, I would say as well, you know, like not everything I think, I think there has been a sort of rush to pivot everything for online consumption over the last 18 months. And the reality of it is, is like, we all have to, we have to accept that a lot of artwork doesn't actually transfer into that context at all. And we all have to figure out how to sort of build that into the work, you know, like foreground the fact that this isn't compatible with the online sphere and make that very apparent, because I think there's sort of now a disadvantage to artists whose work can't be digested or consumed through a screen. And that's something I'm really struggling with when I'm trying to, you know, research people's work. 
invariably that which transfers to the screen I'm able to kind of jump into more and it's something you've all had to deal with over the last 18 months so I think we all have to just sort of use our imaginations as to how to move on into the next phase of where we're all going uh, with visual art in the age of pandemia yeah um, yeah. There was something interesting that you said as well the other day, Park, is this uh, project you were talking about, you were saying, that looked really good. I wasn't actually there, but that looked really good. And there's this thing with the art world at the moment where we're, we're, we're on social media, we're watching things and they're happening and we're so impressed by it all. But, you know, there's, there's a kind of a laziness that goes with that in terms of the actual experience. And I think that's something we need to be really kind of just uh, attentive to. Just it, it's really important to the away from desk in real life all of that stuff that's what we need to um start focusing on now thankfully for the next little while so. yeah great so thank you thank you very much uh Porik and emma thank you very much it's great to hear your your questions and your comments and congratulations again to this group of graduates who are now finished their mfa officially and just a reminder that there's more performances and talks continuing at IMA. Uh, tomorrow and Saturday um, and you can see more info on that on the NCD website but thank you very much Emma and Horik and thank congratulations you everybody. everybody yeah congratulations yeah, well done, everyone.